Thank you, Chair. It was a pleasure. I certainly don't mind. Please join with me. Whakataka te hau te kita uru. Whakataka te hau kita tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta. Kia mā tara tara kita. E hi a ki ana te atukura. E tio. E huka. E hu. Tili. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Leanne, do we have any apologies, please? We have an apology from Councillor Taylor for absence. Right. Somebody keep, please move. Mm. Councillor Foley and Councillor Ormsby. All those in favour say aye. Aye. As you know, carried. Housekeeping. I'm required by <coughs> tell you this is meetings being live streamed. You're being recorded. <coughs> in the event of an earthquake, drop, cover, hold. The shaking's long and strong. Head out the door and head down Dalton Street to the hill. Climb to higher ground. Evacuation, the alarm sounds. Go out of the building through the nearest exit and assemble on the grass here in the corner here, which we've done before. Uh, the council chamber is currently designated as a public place. The policy is no more than, uh, no less than 1.5 metres of physical distancing and face masks must be worn at all times. For those who don't know, all uh, the toilets are down the hall here on the right, the left hand side. Right. Next item on the agenda is conflicts of interest declarations. Are there any further any conflicts of interest that need to be declared for today's meeting? Seeing none. Confirmation of the minutes of the 23rd of February 2022. Someone move the minutes. So move, Mr Chair. And Bake, Ormsby. Yes. Errors, remissions. Done. I'll move the minutes. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All right. Contrary, no. Mm. Carried. Uh, before I move to the follow-ups to the last meeting, I'd just uh, like to have a bit of a pause there. We're going to say it's going to be a, quite a, a lengthy meeting. We're going to have Zooming in uh, under the significant organis acti organisational activities, uh, the mayors of Wairau and Central Hawke's Bay, discussion on the recent uh, floods and rainfall events. Uh, there'll be a useful discussion. We've got some challenging <coughs> uh, items on the agenda. But I do want to, uh, before we move on, to say, acknowledge that we are in the middle of a pandemic. <coughs> the virus is... Uh, 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 are running around the place. Uh, people are getting the prickly cough and having to be off work and uh, um, it's having a debilitating effect on this organisation, on all organisations. It's challenging businesses locally and it's putting our health and other professional staff on the front line under enormous pressure. I think it's fair to acknowledge that our uh, GPs, health professions in, the, in, our, in our community have done an outstanding job. Uh, there are people who are being managed and looked after at home, and they have been to see our Taifena, a couple of our Taifenas, and they are distributing food and looking after people uh, with uh, a huge burden and doing it uh, amazingly well, predominantly with uh, volunteers. Uh, so the region is under strain and pressure, uh, with as it was with the virus, with a, a significant event that puts more on it. So we're in a bit of a tough place at the moment. So I just think we need to acknowledge all of those businesses are doing it, uh, 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 doing it a bit hard at the moment. Our agricultural industries are doing it hard. It's a tough place for all of us. So I think it's a quite a sombre month. Uh, but having said that, we are resilient people and we are standing up and doing a fine job. So thank you to all those people who are do looking after all of our interests. So having said that, I now want to move to follow-ups from the previous Regional Council meeting. And who's going to take us through these? I think these have all been covered off. But Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Just um, uh, noting that all of those follow-ups have been actioned and have you taken any questions that Council may have. Any questions? Chair, just through you, just to, just to make the point that um, the uh, events that are noted in the email to you from Richard Wakeman have actually been deferred to May because of COVID impacts. Okay. Okay. Richard Wakeland's notes for the next meeting. Thank you. All right. Uh, there's no need for a resolution on that. They've been noted. The follow-ups. Significant organisational activities. Item five. Thank you, Chair. So, uh, what I would want, like to note is that there has continued to be a significant amount of delivery across the organisation over the last month. 
notwithstanding the impacts of COVID. Uh, some of those impacts are noted in there, but generally uh, Council has managed to man uh, continue with uh, business as usual, uh, largely, and uh, we're navigating the, uh, the various headwinds uh, that have been referred to um, uh, reasonably ably. Uh, but since the report was finalised a week ago, there has been a significant event which has had a, a major impact on staff and uh, there has been a operational focus uh, for the last seven days in particular on the heavy rainfall event. So um, can I suggest if there are any specific questions in relation to the significant activities report that we take those at the end uh, and move now to, uh, to Mr Dolly giving a presentation on the events of the last week that have in themselves been significant activities for Council. Yes, I uh, like, look forward to Mr Dolly's presentation. Yep. Chris. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, look, my brief was just to give a very brief overview uh, of the event over the last seven days. Uh, we could talk probably for hours uh, about everything that has um, happened. Um, and, look, I think the headline story for our uh, flood control and drainage networks is on the whole. They have uh, protected the community um, from significant uh, impacts and we have wide-ranging, probably uh, minor damage uh, to infrastructure all the way from Wairoa to put down, um, down to Central Hawke's Bay. So we're in the middle of collating um, that list. Uh, so I'll just go through each of the regions in quick succession and um, then Ian will probably uh, talk uh, about a land management response, a few more details, and we also have Ian McDonald who can provide um, some insights uh, as well. Um, so effectively, a uh, significant rainfall event over the whole region uh, this chart here is actually uh, a day and a half old and uh, Ian's more current one uh, shows another 100 millimetres of rain up in the Wairua district. So that, that puts us at many stations up in Wairua getting uh, four to 500 millimetres over the last week. And the other area that was hit hardest is around the Ruahini Ranges, the foothills there um, in, the, in the 300 millimetres uh, over that week. So significant um, volumes of rain. Uh, that have impacted all our areas uh, quite differently. So first, um, up in Wairoa, uh, one of our challenges uh, was the closure of the road. Uh, it was closed for most of the event and we have, uh, we have had staff up there at the beginning and we've got staff up there again today and we're flying the schemes uh, tomorrow uh, to get some aer aerial intelligence of the whole area. Um, the river was in flood, you can see there uh, quite typical flood levels up into the reserve uh, with the swings, etc., in, in flood. Um, but a, a one in year 20, uh, a one in 20 year uh, level uh, up there. A significant event for us was a successful opening of the new river mouth, which, which I believe has made a substantial difference to those um, flood levels. And you can see there in the, in the eastern catchment, much higher return periods of one in 50, one in 35. Um, the guys are reporting this morning there's a lot of slumping of drains, a lot of erosion on the Wairua River. Um, and so once we get all those details in, again, we'll have a, a large volume of work um, to undertake. Um, and also of note that the, the river flooded State Highway 2, which was part of the reason it was closed um, for a while. So that's just a high level summary of impacts there. Most of our infrastructure there in, is, is, is uh, small drainage schemes which have a, a low level of protection uh, to enable uh, rural, ac uh, rural activities and, and uh, horticulture, etc. So if we look at the Heratonga Plains, uh, quite different, uh, generally a lower level uh, of rainfall um, but still a lot of damage around the place. Um, So we've got uh, the Turaikuri uh, River reasonably low, one in, one in five level. Um, the Nalaroto again reasonably low, one in five level. Our drainage schemes were effectively at full tilt, um, so they were, they were on the, uh, on the edge uh, but performed well. Uh, one of the proactive things we did there is you see the photo of the four tractors pumping the Taipo stream into a detention area that's, uh, that was available to give additional capacity to that particular um, stream, so that was quite a successful um, operation. Uh, we had a lot of uh, erosion uh, at West Shore, so we lost a lot of shingle and the water came into the reserve there. Uh, and again at Te Wonga, Hamuana, um, the ocean coming through in various places. 
So there's a few photos there as well showing um, typical <coughs> damage. Uh, we've lost a number of culverts and uh, one of the photos down the bottom, it's a little bit hard to see uh, due to the scale, is erosion uncovering uh, old tip sites. Um, so we will no doubt discover a number of those farm tips and the like. Uh, so we'll be dealing with those. Um, so Herotonga, in terms of our big flood control schemes, uh, not under huge pressure, certainly our drainage schemes are under immense, uh, immense pressure there. Uh, then if we go down to uh, Central Hawks Bay, some big flows down there. Um, we had the Waipawa River at Waipawa up over a 1 in 100 year um, event. Um, and so again, demonstrates the value of both our rainfall network and our flood modellers. We, we were able to have a discussion with Central Hawke's Bay District Council about the safety uh, of some of the residents there and try and make some predictions around whether we need to move those people out during daylight hours. So um, in the end, we didn't need to, um, but it's great to have that capability to provide um, that line of sight. Um, issues are on the Makaratu around Speedy Road. Um, so that's not part of our scheme in there. It overflowed a private stock bank. Um, but nevertheless, that, uh, that occurred. Um, but getting reports back on the parts of the Makeda 2 where we did the IRG gravel extraction, they performed a lot better in this event. So it's just showing when we get through all of that material, there'll be that significant um, change uh, in the level of service. In the middle there, you can see some of the erosion that's occurred on the upper Tuki Tuki. So there we had a hollowed edge protection that we lost and it's taken out um, a pump shed and a few other bits and pieces uh, of the farmer's operation there. Um, and a photo showing some typical uh, overtopping uh, on, on one of our stop banks up off uh, Tika Kino Road. Uh, and of course, uh, what everyone's seeing in the media is uh, the fantastic suspension bridge that we had uh, is pretty much a write-off. Um, so we'll be working to replace that over the, the next few months. So uh, significant, um, uh, significant impacts there. So look, that's a, a higher level. Um, we've got representatives from both Central Hawke's Bay and uh, Wairau District Council to, to provide a bit of information, but before we do that, just invite the two Ians in for any further comment. Ian squared, which one's going to lead first? Uh, this Ian, I think. Ian, this Ian? Ian. Well, that Ian. Ian. Sorry. The one-eyed Ian. The one-eyed Ian, yeah. Um, so from the civil defence group perspective, um, this was a what we call a level two emergency. So what that means is that essentially it was um, managed by the individual councils with our coordination over the top of it. Um, we. Um, we were holding um, meetings with all of the regional, uh, sorry, all the district council uh, controllers and the emergency services twice a day, um, and essentially um, where there were issues or concerns, and we were able to escalate those up higher, either to either as part of discussions with the regional council or with NEMA. Um, that's that's what essentially occurred. So. Um, in terms of uh, the preparation, I mean, we had our first meeting, I think, was on the morning of the 23rd, um, where the rain had yet to come to Hawke's Bay, and there was a lot of uncertainty in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the forecast. And I think from my perspective, I was really pleased to see that um, in that meeting, a number of the councils that had already activated their incident management teams had already started work on their infrastructure, had already started preparing um, stormwater systems, pumps, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, and I think there was some really good coordination between the councils and the regional council as well. So um, where we are at at the moment is that uh, we've now sort of the rain, the the, the warning has been lifted, um, and so we're now out of out of uh, out of um, concern of the rainfall. Although we are expecting some more rainfall over the weekend, but nowhere near the levels that we've had over the last week. And so the group is now um, helping um, with the next stage, which is the, the move into recovery. Uh, and that's really where um, Ian and his team will come into it. So I'll pass over to the next one. Thank you.
So look, just thought we'd help provide a little bit more, so I'm just gonna take the mask off so I can talk properly, a little bit more context around um, where, where we um, know the issues are, and I guess this, this um, map highlights that for you. So what, what we've done, and this is thanks to our wonderful climate scientist, Dr Kathleen Kosniak, um, the, the, the graph, or the, sorry, the map represents um, the highest eight-day eight rainfall uh, in any year across the region. So what she's, she's done is taken from all our sites what's the highest total in an eight-day period. Uh, she's then got a mean of those rainfalls across the region and then compared the rainfall between 28, 21 and 28 March uh, with the, the median across the whole region. So if you like, what you're seeing represented is a proportion of the median highest eight day rainfall event in the region. So what that means is that the darker the colour, uh, the more <coughs> intense and significant the rainfall totals were. So the dark blue being over 226% of the highest eight day rainfall uh, in that area on average before. So it really just helps us sort of figure out where are we going to go to, to start doing some stuff. No surprises that um, it, it's been quite patchy across the region. The, the Central Oaks Bay totals, although high, are obviously nowhere near as high as they have been in Waira and particularly concentrated in that inland Tanaroto, Mangapoiki, Hangaroa, Upper Ruakaturi uh, part of the catchment which is where we're getting all the feedback from uh, in terms of the issues. What we're seeing right now as we move into a recovery phase is that we're needing to pull together some agency coordination. Um, there's obviously a lot of stuff happening across various agencies at the moment, um, a lot of intelligence gathering, a lot of networking, but it's not aligned and coordinated. So we're pulling together this afternoon a small um, coordination group uh, to, to start the discussion on alignment and management of resources so that we're not wasting effort or duplicating effort across the key agencies like ourselves, the TAs, MPI, uh, the, the Rural Advisory Group um, uh, and others. So a, a very um, interagency approach. Um, so what we're doing is we're, we're dusting off the old tool that we used for the drought response a few years back to be our primary uh, intelligence gathering tool. It's a, it's a spatial platform, hence the use of maps. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to use the map uh, to target our efforts. So basically we're saying let's let's go to those areas that have been highlighted with the highest rainfall and start gathering intelligence on what the lay of the land is. We'll capture it in this um, shared platform and then all agencies can use that intelligence for their own uh, planning and work, and then um, we'll, we'll obviously be running the interagency coordination across it as well. So that work is underway now. Um, the, the platform's being uh, geared up, ready to go. Um, and like I say, the the, um, the meeting is going to occur shortly between the agencies. Um, we want to develop quickly a, an action plan, if you like, that's going to look at what we're doing now, what we're doing next week, next month, and next year. The reality is that for the regional council, particularly land management functions, and certainly I suspect for the TAs, uh, there's going to be some years of work ahead of us because these uh, sorts of events and the impacts are not the sorts of things that you manage within uh, weeks or months. They will spend years of sustained land management support and intervention um, for landowners in those affected areas. Uh, we want to also develop some communications out to those communities to tell them that we're on the job and we're doing things um, and explain what that looks like so they don't feel like they're isolated and unnoticed because that's far from the case. Um, and we're also looking at uh, reasonably quickly pulling together um, workshops within the community to guide and support landowners with the right advice um, and information to farm through this and into the future. Uh, so it, that worked very successfully in the 2011 event down on the southern coast, so we're, we're going to take the same approach. And the last thing is, um, as soon as we can get a, a reasonable weather window, um, we're going to be tasking satellites across the area to, to get some up-to-date aerial imagery and um, undertaking some uh, fixed-wing 
um, aerial photography work in the area, but the, um, the land science team are going to work on a process and a plan for that. Um, and then really quickly, um, just a, a bit of a snapshot of the sort of, it, it's very similar to BOLA, but, but um, uh, sort of isolated in the area affected, obviously. But it gives you, just gives you a bit of a sense of the scale. These are just very, very brief snapshots. We're building quite a comprehensive library of, uh, of the effects. And um, serendipitously, there's a horse in the foreground because right now that's the only way you'll get around on that land um, uh, because it's not the place you'll be taking heavy machineries. And, and, and look, farmers can, um, in many situations, can't, can't get out the back of the farm um, because tracks have gone and, and, and or you wouldn't want to take an LUV or a quad across that land. So horses are coming into their form. That's me, happy to take questions. But quickly, that particular area that is heavily impacted, the scarring is similar to, of the landscape, similar to Bowler? That's the feedback we're getting, is it's very similar to Bowler in terms of its effect, but it's obviously uh, in, a, in a smaller area than Bowler affected. Okay, any other questions? Who's what, uh, <coughs> Charlie? Yeah, um, just, just briefly, I know a few people had concerns about the bar being open and how it was open and how the decision was made, because it's obviously quite critical. Um, can you explain how it was done and if there's any learning from it? Yeah, so look, um, we were in um, uh, many discussions, I guess, with the contractor uh, leading up to it. You'll recall that uh, uh, over the Christmas period, we had a tropical low came down and we attempted an opening um, which wasn't successful due to the rain not eventuating. As Ian said, we had a high variability in the forecasting that was initially happening. So we were in constant discussions about what to do. Um, and in the end, we decided that we should be opening uh, the, new, the new mouth. And that's exactly what the contractor did. So I think the teams, they've done the right thing. There's a few rumours flying around, um, but it was our decision. Uh, we have the permissions to undertake the activity. Um, contractors uh, don't have permissions to uh, to open rivers, so it's always our call, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, Will, <coughs> um, Chris, um, I was out at that Makitatu site uh, yesterday, um, saw where the extraction had happened and hadn't happened, and um, definitely a massively positive impact where it has occurred so far. Um, and so that, that, that was great to see. And, um, you know, we're only at the start of that project, yeah. yet I would say that the scheme held up pretty well, considering, yeah. which, was, which was good. Um, just, uh, is there any concern or, you know, the Chilean needle grass area downstream yeah. where we still don't have a resolution for that? And we saw how close we got to the top of the stop banks and places and the, the, the risk to, to people's homes and, and the potential need to evacuate. You know, do, are we gonna to have to make a call one day about the trade-off between, you know, protection of um, property, basically the level of service of the scheme yep. versus the biosecurity risk? Yep. So I think we're probably not quite at, at that point. Um, one of the things uh, we've done through the IRG project is actually try and pinpoint precisely the location of the Chilean needle grass. So we've done a lot of surveying uh, this year to determine exactly where it is. And we're currently involved in a process with the biosecurity team uh, to essentially remap the extent uh, of the Chilean needle grass, which will allow us to go further down uh, in, into that area that was traditionally restricted. So I think the first thing is We've, uh, we've got the numbers, we've done the, done the science, we've done the hard work to sort of get a better grip on that. And so it will extend that period, uh, that extent. The other thing, I guess we prioritise all of our gravel extraction and that, that gravel in that segment uh, is not currently our highest priority. We've got lots of, like in the Makata 2 and other areas, um, uh, lots of other gravel uh, to take out as well. So between those two, I think that question is a good question but it's probably not a question we need to answer right now, but, but maybe in the future, uh, depending on, on how things are. If I could just add to that story that um, we are going to bring you back um, some advice on how, how to manage Chile and Native Grass in the future. It's part of the ongoing review of the biosecurity team. Just to note that right now you have a regional pest management plan that has obligations on it. So if we were to change our approach, we would have to change the plan. 
So it's not something that we can decide on the hoof. It's something that would need to be thought through and considered to manage the biosecurity risks. Thank you. I've now got Michelle for a question. Uh, kia ora, uh, kōrua. Um, so, a couple of the things, so the, the opening of the river mouth obviously made a difference um, of being in isolation of the COVID in the house, and, but I was able to go over and look at the back of the, uh, by the showgrounds, and, and that, that the Awa was, yeah, she was getting close to flooding our township, but um, the river mouth opening made a difference, and then I went down this morning before the hui today, and yeah, it really blew it out. It's, it's really wide. And there's two. There's the, the original mouth is still there, um, but I believe the, the, where you made the opening has made a big difference. Um, I just talked to uh, one of our Fanaga up in the Rapatiri, and their road hasn't been open since Tuesday last week. So they're, they're stuck up there. Lucky they're farmers and they know how to stock up on things. Um, I asked you how, how the, the lay of the land is, There's a lot of erosion, a lot of slips, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, just having a look around, there was a lot of strings, more than, there were a lot of strings that were flooding. Now what was flooding down the road only yesterday. Um, <clears throat> my one my one other concern is, is that I've noted, and I did ask on the Civil Defence page, um, I was here when Cyclone Bola happened, and the main reason that we flooded out, us flooded out, we near the river, was because when we had when they had to open up the lake, um, the lake exceeded the consentable level on the 25th of, of March. It's now the today the 30th, and it is 583.8 mas or whatever that means but it's way past the um, the level that's allowed. I'm concerned about that because the lake can have a huge impact on our community. Um, and then, yeah, and then just, just the note, all the water was concentrated in the white area where all the highly erodible lands are. Um, and uh, so what's the focus of that? What's, what, are we, what are we gonna do there? Um, so there's going to be a lot of damage around our community, especially for the farming community. And uh, a lot of erosion, I saw riverbanks acreage going in that hour. So um, um, here we go, here we go again, back to this place that took a, a, a whole lot of flooding for that to uh, be focused on again. Um, it's a huge river and it'll do what it's got to do, but um, the mouth opening was a, was a, was a, was a great thing. What I want to know, and I said, people want to know, why did you start before when the weather was fine and then when we were flooding, yeah, you, you, you just have to go out there and open it up for me as a bit of a, a lull in the rain. I don't know if that was extremely dangerous because that river was going at speed. Um, yeah. And I'm sure a lot of water was in there too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you did, did break up a bit there, but... Um, Look, I, I haven't. I have to find out the exact details. I wasn't there on the day when it was opened, but certainly the health and safety of the contractors is a is a key concern, uh, and we keep an eye on that. Um, and we've got to balance uh, that with the with the work that's being undertaken. So, my expectation and statement to staff is we do not put people in harm's way for the sake of the job, um, and they're back 100% mm. to make those decisions. Yeah, I just I would have thought it was pretty dangerous because because that. That river was, it sounded when I walked over towards the hill, it sounded like a waterfall and rapids all in one. And it was just, it was hooping it. The, 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 what about the lake level? Because it's still right there. The lake, who, who's got. Lake Waikaremoana. I, I understand the lake, but I'm just asking the question who is responsible for managing the lake? Is it the generator? or someone else? So it would be the generator, and they've, they've got a consent um, that uh, Katrina might talk to. What I suspect is happening is they're effectively using the lake as storage to avoid all of that water having to come down the river exactly. and add to, add to the damage. So in context, I would have thought that's probably a sensible decision, but that I'm not sure whether Katrina's well, team... Ra ra rather than guess, it, could someone make some inquiries of the generator, find out what's the, exactly what the story is, and then circulate that? Could you do that? I've got a yes to that. Thank you, Michelle. We'll get some investigation. Thank you, Genesis. 
Genesis. I, I understand it's Genesis, but we'll make some inquiries on the generator, find out what's happening, and then circulate the advice so you're well informed. And well, uh, Chris yeah, will, uh, will contact the contractor to see what exactly happened on the day, just to assure ourselves that we took all due care. Martin. Thank you, uh, Chair. Look, uh, just as a you know, context of the question, I am concerned that this is but the prelude and the real show is still yet to come, despite how severe it was. I, I must say I'm full of admiration, as I'm sure we all are as councillors, for the comprehensive and decisive range of response uh, to this. this we, you definitely gave the impression of we've got this. And so my question is, you know, with their learnings, you, you still had these vagaries and the forecasting assumptions and difficult to sort of pin that down. Were there any learnings out of the Napier experience that you've been able to apply uh, to the benefit of the response in this situation and equally going forward from it to the future? So I can comment on a few early, uh, early learnings and of course we've still got to go through a proper debrief uh, and document all, all the <coughs> learnings. Look, a couple of things that, that I'm very mindful of is what we learned from Napier was to, 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 to mobilise early. And so that's what we did. And so when Ian says they asked around and everyone was already acting, uh, that's because we're now um, really acting on, on every warning. And half, most of the time it never eventuates, yeah. but this time it did. So we were, we were well prepared. The other one, uh, what we've learned from this event is that we can't rely on, on um, State Highway 2 always being open during, during an event. So we need to be more proactive to station staff um, up there um, because for periods of time we had no um, designated staff up there. We are still able to contact catchment staff and staff at WDC and send intelligence reports, but we were challenged with that, that boots on the yep. ground type scenario. And the third one is uh, how we respond to the forecasts. So our flood modelling, we take the recommended forecast and use that in our flood modelling but there are actually more than one forecast available. So we still got to work through the detail because it is more work, but perhaps going forward, we should be looking at the envelope of forecasts and modeling each one, because what we found, particularly up at the wider end, is that the rain that we received generally exceeded the forecast amount. So if we were taking the pessimistic component into account, we would be preparing for the worst and hoping for the best, uh, rather than picking and the forecasters are very skilled and they use all their skills to pick the forecast, but it is a forecast, it's sort of not a fact cast. So, um, so we can do more work, but that's more work for our team. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go to Neil next. Yes, thanks, uh, Mr Chair, and uh, just a comment and then a, a question. Uh, look, congratulations to, to the team all the way around. Um, Chris and Ian, it was um, uh, a tremendous result. Um, I managed to get around um, most of the pump stations etc around Napier and uh, during the midst of the storm and it was great to see so many council staff uh, at their stations dedicated and, and including throughout the night. Um, I, I certainly know the type of stream pumps were there, I could see them from my bedroom window. Uh, so that, that's a tremendous uh, outcome we've had uh, on song and, and, and really responsive and, and the early Early response, as you say, is, is uh, has been critical in, in that uh, that outcome. Um, my question, one of, the, one of the things I noted in your reference to State Highway Two, and I wonder whether there's, there's a, um, a conversation to be had with Kotahi around not only t Highway Two but the, our other uh, highways in terms of uh, the drainage um, uh, infrastructure they've got in play, because uh, I noted. At the early hours of the morning, you could drive through, you know, nearly door deep um, water uh, on a state highway, and uh, um, I assume they have a consent for the construction, and uh, whether we've got a, a role to play in um, moderating there or improving the performance of those road networks. A, a, a question, I think. Oh, well, a question. Well, you know, what can we do there by way of conversation to to improve our well, I think, as I said before, is to understand the resilience of that road uh, uh, and prepare for it is what we can do. I think we can influence the, the owner of the road and their maintenance activities, but I think the key message for me was to understand the resilience of that road and build that into our into our plans. I don't know if, Ian, you've got any other comments? Yeah, I mean, the only comment I would make is that through our Lifelines group, these are things that we can raise. Um, I think also though, but just going back to um, the council's ability to influence um, the design of the roads, it's very limited because roads are designated, that's my understanding anyway, and, and 
and there's certain things that, that as a government agency they can do. So, um, can, can Katrina, could you Katrina answer that question the, on the consent? Not... No? <laughs> Just in terms of consenting on, on, um, on, on our road network, is a consent required of council? To, what? To, to build a road and put associated drainage in? Uh, if there is a waterway involved, uh, we require a culvert, then yes, uh, but ultimately to build a road, no. Okay. So there's, li there's <coughs> limited a um, opportunity for us to say your road, your road drainage is not sufficient and we want it improved. I, I think that's true, uh, uh, Councillor Curtin, but I also think, uh, uh, following on from the comments by Councillor Williams, that we need to take the lessons from this in whatever we thought was an appropriate level of a culvert, say an old language, a nine inch pipe, is now no longer any good. It needs to be a much bigger pipe. And secondly, the, the lackadaisical attitude we've had in the past about maintenance and making sure they're cleared and things like that needs to be improved because these things need to be ready to go whenever. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think our quality of the quality of our infrastructure needs to be improved and the quality of our maintenance needs to be improved. Otherwise, we're going to have this problem over and over again. Well, point well made. Uh, just, just one, I know you guys are obviously looking for information now. Was, um, how would our, our people out in the rural areas and, and, and on the farms give you that information? What's the best way to do that? Um, so good question, Councillor. Look, what we're going to do is, um, again, back to the map, we're using the, the map to kind of concentrate our efforts and our work. We're going to be proactively um, communicating with landowners in those areas using networks through primary sector bodies, ourselves, the rural advisory group and others. If you've got landowners who need to contact us um, now with information, they can phone our WADA office. The staff up there have got a system to capture information so we can get it across and, and share it with others. So, but we're going to be doing proactive reach outs as well as taking information from people as they provide it. Can you also explain the, um, the, the job of the, um, the Rural Advisory Group and, and who hops on that? So the Rural Advisory Group is a, effectively a network of networks. It's a, um, it's a body that's comprised of people from farming businesses, primary sector bodies like Beef and Lamb New Zealand, Federated Farmers, uh, veterinarians, farm advisors. So there's a plethora of people who work across the agribusiness sector. It includes ourselves as council, territorial authorities um, and the idea is that that provides us the network of people to create connections and contact people in the farm landscape as well as provide that intelligence back into us. So for example we know that Federated Farmers and Wairau have been proactively engaging and talking to farmers as have beef and lamb so they can provide that sort of toing and froing of intelligence. Uh, that we can then use to, to support our response in this case, um, or recovery, and, and the response as well. So they, they fit under Ian's um, SEDEM team, they're part of the SEDEM model, um, but they're an incredibly important um, uh, system of people to support these sorts of activities right now. You know some of the biggest landowners up there are uh, Māori and corporations, aren't you? Are they on there? So, so we have um, Hilson Collier as part of the Rural Advisory Group, um, Fenton Wilson, so we've tried to create connections into whether it's Māori agribusiness or, or the primary sector bodies, it's whoever whoever is available that can provide those those networks. I've Thank one, you. I've got one more question. Uh, one more. I've, I've got me, Alex Walker, on the like. I'll come back to that after. after yeah, but ours is a bit wild. <laughs> and I've got Craig Little on the, on the line too. Craig's next. <laughs> so that's what I. <clears throat> I'd like to now invite uh, the Mayor of Central Oaks Bay, Alex Walker, and the Chief Executive, Monique, uh, to make a presentation. Also on the wall there we have the uh, well-known and famous Mayor for Wairau, uh, Craig Little, and uh, I'll ask invite Craig to speak after Monique and, uh, and Alex. So, Alex, over to you. Uh, kia ora koutou. Thank you, um, Rick. Um, hello to you and to Will. Um, I can't quite see everyone who's in the room, but um, Matua, Mike and Fire Michelle, I can see you on the Zoom screen. Um, thank you all for having us. 
Look, I just want to um, give a brief update in the context of the regional picture you've just seen, which is um, we had uh, a moment in time for a few hours on the morning of uh, Thursday last week uh, where uh, we were challenged with that uh, statement that you mentioned before about we've got this. Um, and in fact, if it hadn't stopped raining when it did um, mid Thursday morning, we would be in a different situation to where we are. Um, we have seen um, impacts in Central Hawke's Bay, which are very much connected to the river corridors. So this is not um, at the scale of what Wairua is obviously seeing at the moment with the land uh, and infrastructure damage in the rural areas, um, mostly confined to our river corridors where the rainfall um, saw those rivers come up very uh, quickly and the one in 100 year event for the Waipawa River in particular I just want to touch on, um, which uh, the team responded to incredibly well uh, and what has happened is that uh, we've identified a couple of areas um, in, the, in the stop bank and flood control area which maybe we could in the future plan for some better resilience in terms of protecting um, not just the town but our core water infrastructure as well. There's a bit of teamwork we can um, approach with that. Um, also just wanted to pick up on the performance in the coastal areas so places like um, Elsthorpe where there is um, uh, flood control schemes that worked quite well. We did have um, the, the valley along the Mangakuri Spring slash river at the coastal area which also saw um, really big increases in uh, flow which had some impacts for farmers along that corridor. The damage that in the rural community is experiencing would probably be summed up by um, fences and crops which are in the close ur proximity to the rivers. So it's been very much about the river flow uh, coming up and then coming down, um, which obviously also took uh, our beautiful swim bridge on the Toki Toki, but that um, has captured the hearts and minds of our people. Um, but in the bigger scheme of things, um, uh, it is very sad, but it is manageable. Um, and uh, we had some challenges uh, with our drinking water and wastewater in particular uh, infrastructure, which um, I'm going to ask Monique just to quickly touch on to give you a snapshot of what that looked like. But but all in all, I um, was very, very proud of the way that the Central Hawke's Bay team um, stepped up uh, last week. Um, very thankful to the Civil Defence Group and the way that they interacted um, to provide additional support when required and the support of Regional Council um, when it came to modelling, when it came to response, so when it came to understanding what might happen um, if the stop banks and white power were breached uh, and all of those things. So uh, teamwork uh, worked really well from our perspective. But Monique, would you like to speak about the uh, infrastructure? Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Um, so as Mia Walker has described, um, clearly our infrastructure uh, uh, was under pressure. Um, probably if I start with drinking water, uh, you, some of you will have seen we had to put on a boil water notice uh, in Waipukuro, which ended up being in place for four days, um, and that was because of the turbidity levels. Uh, obviously coming out of the river um, and the requirements really, um, not only from Tama to Arawai, but um, in terms of what was going to ensure uh, the health and wellbeing uh, of our community. Uh, interesting that, um, you know, Waipukuro, where we had to introduce a boil water notice, that was actually the treatment plant that was less um, uh, compromised uh, by the flooding. Uh, our whole drinking water treatment plant in Waipawa was um, completely flooded um, and uh, we were very close uh, to having to put in a boil water notice uh, for Otani and Waipawa um, but with really good uh, I suppose um, planning in place but also um, you know I think it reflects probably the investment that councils made over the last couple of years around backup uh, and uh, technology um, we didn't have to do that because the, while the turbidity levels rose, they didn't ri rise to the benchmark and then they um, decreased pretty quickly. Uh, the, we are now at the point obviously working um, collaboratively with the Regional Council just to understand what it looks like to improve the resilience of our Waipawa ball field um, via um, the flood protection and just want to acknowledge kind of the proactive nature of um, James and Chris and your team who, you know, not only were there on, there on the day, but have been visibly there throughout this week, um, working with us around that so promptly. Uh, our wastewater treatment plants uh, were under pressure. Um, 
uh, and you know uh, there was uh, not only the emergency um, overflow, but there was um, uh, the particularly the Waipawa wastewater treatment plant, um, which you know nearly flooded due to the high ride, high river levels. Um, but you know acknowledging that it was the stop bank that provided the protection. Uh, but to Mayor Alex's point, if it had kept raining, um, uh, you know we were we were nervous uh, about that. Uh, you know outside of that, our roading network um, of course was under pressure, and at one stage, you know we had over 30 roads. Uh, closed uh, and of course Mayor Walker has commented on kind of the other amenities um, and assets which we all dearly love in CHB being our um, cycle trails which um, saw um, the Taweta Bridge uh, be washed away. Uh, if I could just note before um, kind of we take any questions just acknowledging the work of the Regional Council um, and supporting us through the event. Uh, I think it was you, Chair Barker, who um, asked the. Sorry, I think it might have been you, Councillor Williams. Like, what were the lessons learned? Well, our lessons learned, I think, we've are uh, really reflective of the journey that our two councils have been on over the last few years. And what we saw was, um, you know, a very quickly reach out to the regional council, uh, and you know, led by Chris and James, uh, really prompt. Um, leadership but also advice um, particularly from the river modelling team and so I want to acknowledge that you know there was a point in time there where we had a 15 minute gap um, to make some pretty critical decisions about potential evacuation uh, and the calm and composed way that um, those experts interacted in the conversation um, but also kind of the officers and the field officers on the ground doing manual inspections um, just, I, I think we saw the benefits of a really positive relationship between the two authorities. So, thank you. Uh, thank you, Monique. <clears throat> Before I take questions, I'll now go to uh, Mayor Craig Little of Wairo and his able Chief Executive, Kitia. Would you like to give a presentation to Council, please? Hello, he's talking, he's talking. You're on mute, Craig. You're on mute, Craig. Yeah, that's what normally happens to me. But <laughs> hey, Tina Koto Kato to everybody, and thank you so much for um, you know joining us all up together. Um, you know, big big mehi to you guys because it's, the relationship has has just been extraordinary over this time, and and it's just an example, of probably the journey we've all been on, and it's just showing some really great leadership that we're all working together um, to make this happen. Um, I'd like to you know a mehi out to um, all councillors, um, especially and staff, and especially Councillor Lambert, who has been on the phone with me a couple of times. Michelle, great to see you sitting there. Uh, you're probably sitting at home, I guess. And um, yeah, just acknowledgement. I'd like to acknowledge Craig Goodyear. He's just one out of the box, that guy, and he's, his information that's coming out is just second to none. And it's been a huge um, help to Wairau just planning and getting our facts straight. So that, that's just great, and that staff has said that too. So thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge the contractors, emergency services, civil defence staff, and the staff of HBRC and WDC who are working together famously. So that's great. And it's great um, we've got a resilient community, as with CHB, all working together as well to make this work. Rightio, have we got someone controlling the. Um... Yep, yep. Yep, it was great that that was up for CHB too. So. Um, a bit of colour for them. Hey, let's just move on. I'm, I'm just going to move through slides quickly because the um, photo says a thousand words. So that's yep. just basic down the river bank and Wairau. You can see the tables and the chair of the other far side there. So we were pretty undated with water. Luckily, the bar was opened and uh, that was a big saviour. The tides were going the right way in the end. So that was a big saviour. Next one, please. That's another shot from the lighthouse. You can see where that water is under the bridge. That's not the river. That's where you normally walk and to the left there is just below the lighthouse. And you can see the edge of the river is where those flaxes and everything are. Next one, please. And that's our skate um, park. It was a bit of a swimming pool. Um, so yeah, it was, but anyway, the river's, got, the river's gone down. It went down the first, second day. So that was, we were a bit lucky really. Next one, please. That's the bar. After you guys had um, cleaned it out, you can see the little channel you made to what it turned into. So it was a godsend and that's, you know, part of the clean up there we're looking at. Next slide, please. Ooh, good boy. Yeah, and you can see the digger in the distance, how small the machine is compared to the big bar. You know, it just was a um, great bit of work getting that open, guys. Well done. Uh, next slide, please. 
that's just a bit of a clean up uh, that's down at Pilot Hill so you can see a lot of stuff where that's one of the streets in town the North Clyde and that's Curry Sure, I'm help you on that one. Yeah, yeah. And next one, please. So there's another one. You get. There was water everywhere. You know, both the two events were quite different. One was just a massive rainfall in the headlands, um, 50 year event and 20 year event in town, and then that reversed. And I don't know what year event it is in town, but it just kept coming between Wire and Fraser Town, and it just wouldn't go. The river was down. This wasn't the river creating. This it was just water. Just couldn't get away. Next one. On, please that's by our holding tanks here just as you're coming across the railway line into Wairau you can see the water everywhere especially along Arateri stream and that that does boost the banks it's just too much water in one one short amount of time and that's a farm just up beside the golf course and that's uh was his tractor and that came up that went from about <laughs> nine or ten, ten o'clock um to the next Wasn't morning tractor. when he got up and and the one on the left is actually a deer fence, not a, a sheep fence. So you can wow. see the extent of the water. And, and, and hey, look, it's lower, lower lying areas. Um, I'm not actually quite sure where that is. That one was, oh, here we go, Mungapoiki Road. Yeah, that, that's been a major out there. They've got, I think they got about 270 mil in a very short time. So the next one, please. Yeah, they do. Aramati Road, that's always a hassle, always goes under. Next one, please. Um, yeah, that Arateri stream, that's just out of Wairau. And that's up at uh, Mungaroa, that's up at Rukaturi. So they've had, they've had a hell of a hiding up there and they've been isolated actually for a few days. Next one, please. That's the New Harker River. You'll be pleased to know all that, uh, that joint venture that we did with the Hawke's Bay Regional Council on realigning the river. Um, it held up. You can see the road there on the right hand side one, it got really close to that. You know, the future works will be building a new sort of some bit of wall along there, but we we're pretty happy, happy that held up. Good. And this is uh, the bridge up at Tinarota Way, um, it's down to one lane, but you can see it's, um, it was scaring out a little bit. Yep. Yeah, it washed out. That's Park Y, that's just going out State Highway 38. Um, that sort of came up quite quite a bit across the road there. So, But it does happen. A lot of these do, these flooding, it will happen. It's not the first time and it won't be the last time. And then that is um, up at Papuni again. Now, they're completely isolated. They've, they've been out for about seven days. We just can't get the road open for them. They've had a helicopter fly in there a couple of times. That's Rukaturi. They, they, they had a bit of a um, main rain bomb as well. I'm sure Next one, please. So State Highway 2, this is going out for 287. That went right under. And then the next one, please. And then further on by Turiroa, that went down under as well. So that's, it happens. And then next one. Uh, that's the water intake. You can see how that's the top of our water intake and that goes right down under, under the river. So that was quite high up there and that, you know, we survived and we there was only one day we couldn't produce water because the silt was just too intensive and, and the water flows. So we, we stopped for a day, but we've got the um, reserves up our sleeve to keep the town going as long as they don't all share at the same time. And we are clean people in Wairau. That's Tinaroto. <laughs> Going out, um, yeah, going out by more Maramara, I think. Once again, that's a big slip over the road that happened there. Another one, please. Oh. Uh, go back one. Is that you trying to rush me, Rick? No, and, no, I'm <laughs> trying to slow you up. Is that Chris? Yeah. Let's so on the left, on the left, that tractor is still in there, but you can hardly see it. <laughs> that's it even came up further <laughs> and and then on the right that's going out to Mungapoiki that's a huge slip um, and that would be probably up to 50 to 100 metres wide so they're, they're starting to clean it out now but it's that, that community's been blocked off there for probably two days next one please this one here an exceptional farmer um, and 
So the one on the right is a slip that's come down, and that's that's probably the most extent of my damage. And on the left is a photo taken this morning, just showing that I probably um, got away with it pretty well. An exceptional um, farmer, I think, is the <laughs> rule we've got for you. Yeah, thank you. And shouldn't have to remind you. And oh, these are just videos, but I think time's running out. You guys can watch those videos at any time, but they're very interesting. Um, there's, yeah, and I've got another photo that just shows. I've just come in and Michelle, you can get with that. Oh, that's up. On, that's up home. No damage at all. This little slips in the young papa there. One in the new grass by the looks of it. Unless it's an old one, maybe. Okay. The one on the left. Probably that's a good one. Next. Standing in it. Jesus. Gone for bloody miles. Wiped out your fence there, David. She's it's a lot of earth. Here we go, up at Toby Taylor's and it's a massive slip which has blocked the creek and rerouted it. Now it looks like this. Jesus. Unreal. That's authentic. <laughs> so so that one there just um, I had another photo but I've lost my mobile phone at the moment. But I was gonna try and put it up on the screen. But that, that one of Toby Taylor's, that whole hill now is all slips and over the back is all slips. It's a bit looks a bit like um, James that um, one of um, out at um, Power Jewels and that years ago, just out of Wairau. Tuhara, is it? Or, um, yeah, that Newhark, between Newhark and Tuhara. So, yeah, it's, it's a major. But but from there to a lot of other places, not too bad. So we vary all over the show. Um, the three waters just quickly, really coping pretty well. The, the um, wastewater has probably gone the best of anything because it's been more um, apart from yesterday was out of town weather events so the pools have held up and like I said the drinking water we just had to stop for a day but everything's managed to keep on top of things so we've been a bit lucky really thank you Rick thank you does Kitty got it you'd like to add there or well I don't know whether Kitty is on screen Mr Chairman just quickly I probably um, next um we need to pivot quite quickly to recovery now. So I um, just want to acknowledge um, the Hawke's Bay Regional Council team for um, we met yesterday with Ian Maxwell um, and just talking about what, particularly for our rural communities, what does recovery look like? Uh, so we're keen to sort of partner and tag team with the Hawke's Bay Regional Council. So, so I think this is probably um, my only comment just around Recovery's going to take a bit of a while. She's a bit of a mess in, in Waiwa, um, and just infrastructure, roads, um, and in particular, some of our communities remain isolated, so our contractors are out trying to ensure that we can get access, um, but it's going to be a long, long road to the recovery. Um, and so we're ready to sort of move into this phase as quickly as possible, and thank you to the Hawke's Bay Regional Council for partnering with us. Kia ora tata. Kia ora kia thank you. Right, questions of uh, uh, me. Hey, Rick, Walker. I found my phone. I'm going to try and put that up on my, in front of my camera, just show you show that, what that looks like now. I don't even know where the buddy. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's all great. You have to go with no, I'm not too good at this. <laughs> No, not going to happen. <laughs> you need to get close to the I'll age of 18. I'll to you, right? Rick, and you guys can bring it up at some stage. <laughs> All right, we're good. Okay, questions. Uh, yes, Charlie. Probably got a uh, question for you, Craig and uh, Kitia. Probably be good if I knew where the camera was. It's in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> Is that um, the, the power outages we had in Wairau? It's not going to work because of your background. With okay. respect. <laughs> Take the background off, you reckon? I think we're on to questions, Craig. Oh, the questions. Mark, you said... no, we're going to miss you, Monique, when you leave. Yeah. <laughs> questions, right. The uh, the power outages okay. we had in Wairau, it looked like they were only for country people. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, I'll wait, wait, wait till this video is finished. Oh, my goodness. So that's that, that's the heart of it. That's just that our, it's on Toby Taylor's, Michelle. Oh, wow. That's huge, isn't it? Yeah. So that's, uh, 
whilst I've always said to James that a lot of slips don't end in the, up in the waterways, those ones certainly do. Yeah. Um, Sorry? James, meeting. Control of this meeting. Wow. Control. Okay. Right, can we have yeah, some water here? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's huge. You know, that's okay. going to take a bit of like, covering that one. Okay, Craig. Craig. <laughs> You've got a question here from Charles, Councillor Lambert. Yeah, yeah. The, the power outages. Alex, it, it actually looked like it was only for country people. On mute, so we can't. Uh, Who's got us on uh, mute? Sorry, hear anything going on. Charles, you will need chair. to speak to the microphone. Start again. Start again. Yep. No, speak what to the microphone. What about now? Yep. Speak to the microphone. It's broken. Okay, we're, we're all good? No, no, we'll speak to it. Okay, but they're over there. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the, uh, the power outages, um, I noticed they were all out around by um, Maru Maru, uh, right back around to um, Mohaka and south, but the town was left alone. Why is that? Our most vulnerable people have run out, and, the most, and they look like they're, they're, they're actually the most um, expendable. Why, why is the line bypassing? How come the, the town has power and the country doesn't? And we were out twice. And, and is someone liaising and finding out why it took so long to get power back in? Craig, did you get that? Yeah, I see Kitty has got his hand up. I reckon he'll ask that. Kitty, do you? Kia ora, kia ora, Mr Chairman, kia ora, your worship, kia ora, Councillor Lambert. Yes, so particularly our isolated communities um, have been affected by power outages just because of slips, branches down which have affected wires and um, uh, the, 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 the power So out. We're certainly working with Eastland Network. Um, interestingly, we still have a number of families who will be out um, up in Tukumukihi and Kotari stations up at Rukaturi. The slips up on the, um, on the Mangapoike are enormous to the point where it's probably going to take us three, four days just to clear the road so that we can get the um, Eastland, Eastland guys in there to repair the damage that's occurred with the power network. Um, and so particularly with our rural communities, uh, the, the, the lines were affected quite badly with the slips and with the... Um, uh, but we're working with Eastland to ensure that we can be much more resilient going into the future. Into the next one year, you might want to see how they've gone and organised us and, and change it around. I, I think the biggest thing, Charlie, is those lines at the boat areas are, are, are basic spur lines and they don't always, unfortunately, they probably don't connect down to the, and I could be wrong, but they're never used to connect, say, into um, Hastings or Napier. And they're the ones that take, it just happens that wire happens to be still connected, but, and we didn't lose power at all up at um, up home too. So, but we, I'm sure a Kitty will talk to Eastland. Okay, any other yeah, questions? Absolutely. Uh, Will? Yeah, um, Mayor Craig, thanks for um, that report. The, you, you showed a couple of photos of communities or, or roads cut off. Do you have a good um, stock take, if you like, for want of a better word, of, of all those people that are affected and um, kind of fearing in supplies to, to all those people to what they need? Yeah, but I'll probably pass on to Kitty, not because I know the answer, but he's been working with civil defence. But yes, we do have. Uh, if I may just sort of um, springboard off the, the end. So we stood up our welfare um, Sims function yesterday, uh, just given the weather bomb that we did have yesterday. So we're gathering all of the intel now. Um, but yeah, particularly out in the rural districts, um, it's around sort of making phone calls. I had my staff um, reaching out um, as effective yesterday, making phone calls to ensure that any impacted families, farmers uh, are made contact with doing a needs assessment. That's been really, what's been really great is our working with the Ministry of Social Development, so our local office and Karen Bartlett have also reached out to us just to ask us if we need some help around making sure that we're able to do a good needs assessment, a situational analysis of any of our impacted families. Okay. Any other questions? All right, uh, Mayor Walker, would you have got any summing up things you'd like to bring to our attention before I close this session off? Uh, did Uppy have something? I can't see Uppy from here. Greetings, thank you, uh, Your Worship, and um, through you, Mr Chair. Uh, a question to Ketia, if I may. So I'm currently now residing in the Duarte. Because I can't see them from here. We've um, had Those over 800 right. mils of rain here, and in some places the road was inundated by over five metres. Um, so I'd love to get an understanding of some of the follow-ups around the Kōtari Bridge uh, along the Ruākituri. And um, my question to Kitia is, are there any gaps in being able to reach sections of our community at the moment 
and um, have we reached out to the Tai Whenua and Tato Tata around um, bolstering our ability to communicate with our networks? Thank you, thank you, Akri. Uh, so the response to your question around which communities particularly remain isolated, our concern at the moment is particularly to those that are affected by the Mangapoike slips, which is on the other side of Fraser Um Tukumuki, uh, Kotare, uh, and Kotare comes off through the Tinidoto just before um, just before today. So um, these these stations um, and farms have the, the slips that are affecting those farms are quite quite large, and so it's going to take a while, maybe two to three days, to get a good whip. Well, for Tukumuki, we're trying to get through Hede Hede Toe through the back of Whakaki, but that road is a real yeah. We can't get through. We can't get through Mangapoikia Road, so we're trying to come through the other side. Um, that's quite a large slip. So the, we've got some concerns there. We're um, going to be probably, Eastland are going to be helicoptering in uh, generators. They haven't had power since Sunday. Um, and so being able to um, liaise with Eastland to make sure that those families, those impacted families have uh, the right, the proper welfare support. Uh, Black Charteris' helicopters went back and forward through Papuni, through Rukaturi, through Kotare, through Tukumaki, delivering um, supplies. Um, and so we've um, had, um, and, and the communities themselves have been extraordinarily resilient, extraordinarily resilient. Um, to your second question, we'll be doing a debrief um, and looking at those of our communities that have been particularly impacted and what resilient programs we need to put in place. Rukaturi, um, State Highway 38, we know the two way community always gets cut off. Rural Papa, it's been interesting watching Cricklewood and Rural Papa communities. Puitiri, I haven't even heard from Puitiri yet. So um, being able to sort of know where those communities are, those more isolated ones, and what resilience programs we have to put in place. Kia ora. thank you for that. I'll now go back to Mia Walker. Any closing comments you'd like to make, Mia Walker? Uh, look, no, I just thank, thank you everybody um, for the way that we've worked together on this um, and I just a quick note about this idea of how rural communities get um, disconnected and uh, a good example of that is our Pōrongaho community who um, lost their um, Wi-Fi and cell phone coverage which meant that they, their comms were cut off. They weren't as affected by the rain but their comms were cut off. Um, and the Wellington and Central Offices of Spark, Vodafone and the Rural Connectivity Group um, all thought that it was going to take a helicopter and a circus to um, fix their Wi-Fi connectivity. It took a phone call from our council to our lines company of Central Lines and about two hours for them to get out there and install a generator and get it back up and running. Um, so the local connections um, and problem solving are so vital for our communities to be resilient and I think we all need to I remember that during this um, time of change um, when it comes to local leadership. Um, apart from that, I will uh, leave you and thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, Craig? Yeah, just, just a very total to everybody um, for helping out the two councils. Um, like I said, I've never seen a relationship, even to the fact that we've got Nathan Heath now at Civil Defence taking over from Mike Hardy and Wairall. And as you know, Nathan works for you guys. Um, the whole thing's been really great, but you do get some hard case stories. I got a call from one of the rural support trust people saying, you know, you, you haven't got your, you're not saying what's happening because there's a family isolated and and they're just stressed out. I said, oh, how long have they been isolated for? He said, oh, about two or three days. And I said, what do they need? He said, well, they can't get to town to get their milk. Oh my God. And I said, like up home, we have milk in the freezer because we do get cut off quite often yeah. and it's just a fact of life. So, so whilst there's a lot of damage, we'll get through it. And farmers are pretty resilient. There's damage. I'm more concerned about the more residents and that have been affected um, because that's just, for me, whilst I've missed this one, I've had some pretty major ones before. And that slip I showed you, that was a 10 grand job only two years ago. But we'll get through it. That's just part of what we do. But we've really got to focus on those areas that Uppy's talking about. The, the, you know that we don't want to miss any of the people who you know who written just a house living on an acre or even a quarter acre. So that's all I can stress. So thank you all. Well done. Well, thank you very much. Just to say, uh, just to sum up, two things. One is it's very gratifying to hear the level of cooperation between the staff of the regional council and uh, both the Centre Hawke's Bay Council and the Wairua Council. This is very good. It's very gratifying. Also to reiterate uh, both of your comments about uh, the resilience of our communities and the need to make them more resilient in the future, no question about that. 
And also to acknowledge this is probably the last time we'll see uh, Monique in our chamber. And on behalf of the councillors all here together to say thank you for your outstanding work and we wish you all the very best for the future. I hope that all that you seek in this new change comes true, Monique. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Awesome. So back to the agenda. <laughs> Sorry to be boring like this, but um, uh, we have uh, uh, agenda. We've got the items here and um, we're waiting for questions. So I'll go around the table on item five questions. So where will I like to start? Uh, you're usually quite well prepared anyway. So what questions do you have? I have none at the moment, thanks, Chair. Well, thank you. That's very good. Councillor Curtin. Pass. Pass. Councillor Foss. Uh, item 10, please, if uh, James could translate what the following means. It's around the Te Karamu catchment plan and the same wording is used for Ahereri. The decision was made to roll reporting for the development of catchment plans into a single item. Um, so where is the single item or what's going on there, please? You, it's obviously been a, um, an item of, of strong interest, uh, particularly for myself and, uh, and uh, Councillor Ormsby. So uh, through you, Chair, look, in the interest of just uh, managing the volume of reporting that we're doing through to Council, we thought it prudent to uh, bundle the two together and report on our urban catchment work through to Council when something to report. Uh, at the present point in time, the first uh, staff member uh, who has been appointed doesn't start until the next week or so. Uh, early April, I think, was his starting uh, date. Um, and once work is underway to develop the catchment plans for both uh, Karamu and Ahuriri, they will come through to Council in a consolidated uh, uh, reporting format. Will that report on the health and decrease status or increase or improvement in the quality of water? For example, in the Karimu, or we'll be just talking about the uh, activities that person's doing, gathering various interested groups up. So, in the first instance, they will they they're being tasked with developing a comprehensive catchment plan that will be both their own activities as well as activities uh, across council and with key stakeholder partners. So, it is a, a plan for the catchment. We do have uh, state of environment reporting, and one of the things we'll need to do is identify whether our uh, state of environment reporting enables us to adequately measure uh, the impact of actions undertaken on that plan and that's all work that lies ahead um, but certainly until we have a plan developed and we have uh, actions undertaken by the various uh, persons within our organisation and outside of our organisation that we're partnering with um, there's not going to be a lot to report in terms of meaningful impact from the work. Thank you. Councillor Van Bay. Well, good, thank you. Good. Councillor Foley. Oh, um, not not really a question, just a follow up on the um, the gravel extraction. Um, this site where I was yesterday, the farmer, second generation, 60 years old, roughly, I hope you're not watching Angus, in case I got that wrong, but um, he said he's never known gravel extraction to occur before on the Makato 2. Um, his bottom terrace would always flood in an event like we just had, and this time the water stayed in the river. So it was just so pleasing to see, you know, we've spent so much time discussing, planning, um, sourcing those funds to now see the project start um, and, and, and be successful where it has been implemented is, um, is, is exciting. Notwithstanding that we've still got a lot of work to do and <coughs> um, where we still need to do that work, people were still at, affected and impacted by the flood. So looking forward to seeing the project continue and, and see you know even more results next time. Good positive uh, result, uh, yeah. Councillor Williams. Very brief uh, for Chris, item 11, central catchments, East Clive Stop Bank, reference to HDC landfill optioneering. What is HDC landfill optioneering in a stop bank context, please? S so my understanding of that one is there's a uh, an old TIP uh, recycling centre there and it's, it's uh, vested in HDC, so we need to work with HDC to see what the options are around how we do that work in that area. So there's optioneering is developing options, pros and cons. HDC is there because they own the land that the, the, the TIP's on or the old TIP which is now a recycling centre. 
Yeah. And we're working with them because that's the area where we need to improve the resilience of the bank. Of the bank. Yep. Thank you. That's perfect. Thank you, Councillor Lambert. And now I'm pretty good with this one. Up here, up. Uh, Michelle, Mike. Fine, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right, I think we've covered everybody, have we? All right. Would someone like to move that the secondary organisational activities through to April 2022 be received? Uh, Councillor Foss, Councillor Williams. I'll put the question. All those in favour will say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. Carried. Call for minor items on the agenda. Councillor Van Bank, I thought you had one. No, no. It's, um, it's under... Uh, outside body. All right, outside body. All right, OK. OK, there being none, we'll move on to the annual plan approach, item seven. Uh, James, do you want to lead off the introduction on this? Uh, look, Desiree's available to uh, speak to this paper. Um, so I'll pass right. to her. OK. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Um, so as it says in the paper, this um, seeks a formal resolution from Council to a no consultation approach for the annual plan. So under the Local Government Act, it must be a decision of Council to um, t take a no consultation approach and it's based on an assessment of significance. Um, and uh, staff have assessed the changes um, and our recommendation is that they are not materially different from what was proposed or forecast for year two in the long-term plan. Um, and we're seeking a resolution now so that we can do a media release and signal to the community that we won't be consulting as it's usually about this time that we do consult. Thank you. Questions? Have you taken questions? Yeah. Councillor Foss. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Desiree. Can you just confirm, because I'm just a little bit confused about the wording um, right at the start of the paper and, and just what you said. So um, we, we, you're asking us to resolve not to consult because there haven't been material changes, which is slightly different from uh, us resolving working back the other way. We're not doing this because we don't want to consult. We're doing this because there's, um, in your re recommendations to us, there's no material changes in these documents um, that's outside the existing plan that requires consultation. Correct. Could you just confirm that, that's please? Thank yes, you. that's right. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, any other questions? Would someone like to move the recommendations on the report? Just to, okay, before you do, Mr Chair, I would like to ask the question, and it's similar to Councillor Foss's um, inquiry, um, and, and that's to do with that materiality. Uh, we. We, we obviously we do know that there are material changes uh, upon us and it's not apparent because of our current documentation of, or of our reports uh, are not yet revealing those. Um, but once we come to um, signing off the annual plan, we are likely to know, for example, a lot, a considerably more about how much we have currently spent, how much carryover we've got, uh, what the world looks like uh, when we do that. Is there room to flag, I appreciate the no consultation approach, but is there room to flag the pending issues facing Council so that, in fact, that we do have a degree of transparency um, articulated in the document? Could I summarise that by saying, does this mean that we adopt this on the basis that, given our current knowledge, uh, we have no factual evidence to suggest that there are material to, to, to drive material changes. But we are aware of changes in the future which may occur for it cause us to rethink and we signed it off on that basis. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Uh, that, 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 that would be sufficient. Okay. Chair, can I just clarify? We're not asking our council to sign off the annual plan. No, it's no, only that no. decision to not consult. So reflecting that uncertainty would occur in a document that will be adopted in June. So the annual plan itself will come before council for adoption then. We'll bring further drafts for uh, feedback from council between now and then. Uh, as I indicated in the workshop discussion this morning, I think our immediate opportunity is in our media statement planned for later today, should you resolve today not to consult, uh, that we clarify that A, we're, we're not consulting because we're not making any material changes to our uh, planned levels of service or the track that was 
consulted on last year in the long-term plan. Uh, and that secondly, that there are some uncertainties and dynamic factors that we will be managing through. Uh, so we're acknowledging those and we're front footing those. But other than a media statement today, there's no other way of reflecting that uncertainty in any other uh, vehicle, if you like, other than the annual plan itself, which, as I say, won't actually be up for formal adoption uh, until June. Uh, thank, thanks, James. But I, I just go to the recommendation, which is... Um uh, is that um, no significant change in rating or levels of service. Uh, so we're, we're flagging this at this point in time, uh, but already we do have, um, we're significantly behind with the documentation we've got that tells us we're behind with our levels of service, particularly in the CAPEX area. So just to be clear, um, the level of service is, uh, the level of service is defined formally through level of service measures. Um, and at this point in time, we are not forecasting that we will uh, need to alter any of our levels of service. So yes, there has been some underspend in the first half of the current financial year, uh, but for next year, we're not proposing any changes to the level of service that we are operating towards. Okay. Okay, will someone like to move recommendations one, two and three? Councillor Williams, do I have a seconder? Councillor Van Bake. Okay, Councillor Williams, would you like to speak? Well, just a very just to remind everyone of the, the important point here that we've asked our staff to move heaven and earth to operate within the uh, long-term plan 15% rate increase in an incredibly volatile geopolitical economic context, um, and you know with all of the inflation pressures we've got. So I think uh, the the conversation about not consulting needs to be understood in that context. We're keeping levels of service as projected under the plan working within the rates, expectations of that plan, and it's a great credit to the staff that we're able to do that. So this is a positive. I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Van Buck, you'd like to speak? Yes, similar. Uh, I think it's uh, a credit to staff in this very volatile uh, time in, 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 uh, in, in the world, not just here in, in Hawke's Bay, and that we're actually able to actually come to agreements. And the level of service definitely, uh, as we just heard before, uh, we're actually extremely working hard in our, in our region, and uh, that's credit to our staff. So um, that's why I'm I'm supporting this recommendation. Any other speakers? Councillor Foley. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> look, my initial thoughts with this goes straight to our ratepayer. We came up with the LTP roughly this time 12 months ago, and we thought the world was a, a pretty. Uh, changed place then already and, and who would have thought 12 another 12 months down the track and still got a lot of muddy headwaters um, ahead of us by, by what it seems. So um, look, we're, we're sticking with our plan but that plan is a 15% rate increase. Uh, we've all seen the headlines in the last month, um, inflation, cost of living and so this is a big ask to our ratepayer. Um, I guess I just raised the flag um, for you know, what do we do in another 12 months, depending on, on what things look like? And um, I just feel um, personally, we're kind of boxing ourselves into a bit of a corner here. We we talk about <coughs> cutting the um, the budget or shifting the budget around as much as we can, and and borrowing money if we need to. And and you know, we, where does that end if 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 things don't settle down um, in the world and the economy? So. I think it's just um, something we need to keep a careful watch on and, and um, yeah, see what happens in another 12 months' time. But, you know, um, thanks really to our ratepayer and um, to, to stick with this plan. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? Councillor Williams, would you like to close? I don't think so. All right, I'll put the resolution. All those in favour will say aye. 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 Contrary, no. Carried. Next item, eight, report on the recommendations from the C&S Committee, Corporate and Strategic. Uh, would you like to introduce this paper, Councillor Curtin? Yes, um, thanks Mr Chair, um, and I think we can go straight to the recommendations for a breakdown of, um, of, the, of the, the critical um, critical aspects of it. Um, and we've got uh, firstly the Clifton to Tongoya strategy to consider. Uh, we've got those, uh, the order of more important issues like candidate names, uh, on voting documents um, uh, and participation in the regional council controlled organisation. Um, uh, we've got the uh, appointment remuneration directors policy 
and uh, the statements of intent from uh, both HBRIC and the Foodies. So a very comprehensive and divergent range of uh, issues to, to contemplate. And I'm not sure how, uh, Mr Chair, you're looking to, um, uh, to, to, to consider those, deliberate and consider those. Have we got a plan of what? I have a plan. Thank you. Let's hear your plan, Mr Chair. But happy to share. I think that there are items uh, that are reasonably clear and uh, I think uh, pretty well agreed. And that's items 1, 2, 6, 7, 8, 9, 11 and 12. And I think we should take them as a single resolution. Then there's the item of the Clifton to Tangoya, which is resolutions 3, 4 and 5. I take that as a separate resolution. And on the appointments, uh, uh, number 10 as a separate resolution. Yep. All right, any questions? We've been through most of this material many times. I think it should be well understood by people. Okay, would someone like to move uh, that resolution recommendations 1, 2, 6, 7, 8, 9, 11 and 12 be taken? I'll so move, Mr Chair. Mr Curtin. Councillor Curtin, the seconder. Councillor Van Bake. Any question? Any like, would you like to speak? <coughs> you know, I'll put the question. All those in favour will say aye. Aye. Don't you know? <coughs> Carried. Okay. <clears throat> We now come to recommendations three, four, and five on the Clifton to Tangoyo Coastal Hazards Strategy. Uh, Councillor Van Bake, would like, you to, like move. to move? Someone would like to second? Councillor Williams. Right, is there any questions on this before we go to uh, uh, presentations? Being none, right. Would you like to move, speak, uh, Councillor Van Bake? <coughs> yeah. Um once again, it's a, it's, it's a big move. Um, this has been a, a long time in the making, and we have uh, had many debates about this. And um, um, fortunately, we've had some good advice uh, on, on this uh, from, um, from Rana Asher. Um, and it was a, an advice that wasn't completely out of left field. Um, we were struggling as a joint committee um, to come to an agreement of who and how we would um, support the strategy. Um, and with um, the recommendation of Rana Asher and the discussions since, we've come to a, a conclusion. Uh, we now have before us a, uh, an MLT, and, uh, which we have um, discussed and uh, reworked uh, several times. I think it's very important that we um, uh, that we now endorse this, so that actually the, the draft strategy can be consulted on, and that we actually can start having this discussion with with our community, uh, who we will, um, uh, he which we will heavily rely on uh, for the way going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Look, I. The reason I back this is, is the regionalisation of an issue that is best managed at this level. Uh, and as you, Mr Chairman, pointed out several times, it's the same rate payer that pays whoever's collecting uh, for what will be an undertaking the likes of which this council really hasn't um, embarked on before. But I just wanted to land this in the context of the recent stormwater, uh, well, not stormwater, but the, the, the rain event. Um, there is a view that has been expressed around this table, and I suspect we might hear a little bit more of it, that we shouldn't be engineering and messing with nature and it's going to take its course. Um, the very first point that Mr Dolly made earlier was that the networks have been uh, protecting our communities from significant impacts. And those networks, all of the stock banks, the river gravel extraction, are uh, interventions in nature. We were, we were urged in the long-term plan hearings last year, so just let the, let, pull the stop banks out, let it go. Let them meander, that's what they do. And yes, we could take that approach with the coastline. But both our Awa and the Moana are reacting to climate change. There's no difference. We're intervening in one. It's not a question of black and white, binary, yes or no, we do or we don't. There are questions of degree, questions of sensibility, and questions of resourcing, along with questions of environmental impact. And I think we need to, rather than with a sense of arrogance, assume that we understand what the best answers are for all of the sections of coastline within the strategy area, pay due respect to the many engineers and planners and community stakeholders uh, who have been on this journey for years now. And right, all of the work that Peter Bevan did 
uh, to, to actually see that through and to test it through the resource consenting process and if consented, fund it. So um, with, with that in mind, I, um, that is the reason that I seconded the proposal. Uh, and yes, I am cautious, uh, but uh, look forward to seeing how that progresses over time. Thank you. Any other speakers? There being none, I'll oh, put... Hang on, hang on. Well, I've asked. Yeah. yeah. Are there other speakers? Sorry? I'm happy to speak, Mr Chair. Well, please, where you go. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. And um, uh, this is obviously an issue that um, has vexed and perplexed us for, for, for near on 10, ten a decade now. Um, I was around um, in 2013 when uh, these discussions first uh, were articulated. And um, I can appreciate my colleagues' um, a desire to embrace um, a regional approach um, on protecting our coastline. It sort of fits with a, an engineer's view or, a, if you like, a practicality view of the world. But there are other issues at stake in embracing um, the regional protection structure that is proposed or is, is implicated by um, this transition agreement. Uh, carries with it um, an undertaking um, to certain works uh, of a nature which um, on the normal course of events our regional council would not have undertaken. If, if we were to have the blank bit of paper which we talked about and was so seductive to us all uh, when we first considered this, uh, we would not uh, consider hard engineering solutions that, that are proposed. So, th so the, the concept is, 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 uh, is, is reasonable. Uh, Regionalisation of, of the, the machinery uh, to protect um, part, of the, part of our environment. But it does carry with it a commitment, and this is, this is the issue that, that most vexes me, a commitment uh, to certain works. And we're so far down the track on those, the commitment to our TA colleagues is, is to construct hard engineering solutions and in, this partic in one particular case to dump 120,000 cubic metres of rock and rubble into the sea. Uh, so that, that's the reality uh, that goes with accepting this responsibility. And I go to um, our draft uh, annual plan document and, and our long-term plan where the very first words uh, that are invoked in those documents uh, for the, re uh, the as a regional council our role is to look after the environment and the very, very next breath we're adopting uh, uh, we're committing ourselves uh, to an engineering solution uh, which uh, does not do that it does the opposite of that uh, instead of protecting the natural environment, which is our natural mandate, uh, we're taking on a responsibility to protect the built environment. And I know that is, um, that is, uh, uh, that, that is we do that on a daily basis, but we did inherit, uh, for example, our flood control, our stop banks and the like to protect uh, from, from, um, uh, from flooding. Uh, but if we had the white paper in front of us to design flood protection from rivers, uh, if we wound the clock back 50, 100 years, we would most unlikely, if the regional council was uh, holding true to its mandate, most unlikely to go to a very confined uh, structures uh, that, uh, that tried to contain braided rivers in the way that, we've, that they're constructed today. We have what we've got and we, we do our job because that's what uh, we've inherited. Um, uh, what I would like to say, um, Mr Chair, is that um, uh, essentially by the mere fact of uh, accepting responsibility for um, protecting our coastal environment and committing ourselves to certain engineering solutions, uh, we are leapfrogging other priorities. So as a consequence of this action, uh, we have critical infrastructure which has been demonstrated not only in November uh, 2020 but again in the last few days. Uh, we are compromising that opportunity to upgrade that, um, uh, that infrastructure, for example, for Napier stormwater. Uh, so what we've had is a, a group of pro or properties in the coastal zone 
um, those in particular down, for example, in the um, southern zone, Te Awanga, Hamawana location, uh, jumping the queue in terms of expectations from our community. They've jumped the queue, uh, they are, it's imminently uh, available to them to have those properties, that infrastructure protected. Not so uh, many more thousands of people uh, living in Napier South uh, or, and or across low-lying parts of the city, not so for them. For them, Mr Chair, they're needing to wait. Uh, and sometimes it up to, uh, it's on our 30-year plan, uh, but they're needing to wait for their turn to have their properties protected. And yet, they ought to have been a much higher priority than the coastal properties uh, along our, some of our coastal margin. And that's my objection, is that the fairness and equity is not there. For those people, the answer will be not a coastal uh, strategy, not a, not, not a coastal protection hazard strategy. Theirs is a gumboot strategy, along with the cost of um, this, this, these projects. They'll have their increased rate, they'll be paying the rate, uh, and yet to them we'll be saying, uh, not today, uh, you come back, we'll, we'll get to you in, in, in 10, 15, 20 years' time. Uh, we might get to you in 20 years' time. In the meantime, pay up. And by the way, uh, we may issue you with some gumboots to, uh, to get you out of the mire uh, when that rain inevitably comes. That's my objection, Mr Chair, that we've got a lack of equity, a lack of fairness uh, that accompanies this move. I'm quite ex accepting of the role of Council in, um, in progressing down a regional approach to this. Uh, as long as it had the regional Council lens to it, as long as the staff around our, this building had the opportunity to input their critical uh, uh, conversations. And I'm sorry to say uh, our science team, for example, our coastal scientists, uh, appear not to be seen in this, almost the silence of the lambs on this. So, Mr Chair, that's why I oppose it. If there'd been the white paper that we promised, if there'd been uh, and more transparency around that and more clarity before we undertook it, uh, then I would be supportive of it. But there hasn't been. We've missed and we are walking away from our obligations to the natural environment. And I, d I do not hesitate for a moment in advocating for that uh, any, on every occasion. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Councillor Kirk. Any other speakers? Oh, oh, Councillor Foss. Oh, thanks, Chair. Um, just... just um, uh, if we, I could ask just Jeff to explain a, a little bit. You know, the recent rain events have, um, have had a lot of damage around the place, and uh, we've got a lot of lot of issues. And I visited Te Wonga, um just the other day, and the uh, the seawall, which I think Hastings District Council uh, built along where the campground is, um, has has suffered badly and has been inundated and behind it. And you know that that's nature and all those kind of things. But I'm I've just Throughout the, um, the the journey of this particular paper, my concern has been about the the, un, the the unknown liability of us inheriting assets of other councils, and the great unknown or the what if. So I wondered if if I could just ask um, Jeff, how how would that one play out? Let's just say that the agreements were to all to be signed tomorrow. Would that mean, let's just say, just the day before the storm, that we are now the regional council is now liable to a fix that up and b build it to the standard of the, the remaining wall all of the way. Or is there? Uh, yeah, that's just my ongoing concern. I really appreciate the regionality and all those things everyone's talked about. That's just my. We've come a long way in this space, but there's a real world example of how it might play out. If I have your forbearance for asking that question, Uncon unconventional, but uh... that's me. Well, I asked for questions before, but it's a bit late. Anyway, we'll take the question and Councillor Van Bate, you. You allow me to answer it? Sure, okay. please. That particular wall, and I've seen the photo that you talked about, actually doesn't belong to actually um, the, uh, the Hastings District, uh, District Council's uh, revetment wall. It's an excellent addition, and that actually is, is uh, put there in place by the trust that actually owns that camp, that owns that site. Okay, But uh, I understand your question uh, following through because we actually are taking on some... Uh, some infrastructure from uh, HDC and NCC and uh, we have in the MOT we have an undertaking that they actually are built uh, to the consented um, requirements and that up to the point in uh, 2024 they actually will maintain them 
until the handover. So they, we will receive them in, uh, in good condition, uh, and that's part of the MOT agreement, and that's what we agree on today. So that gives me the confidence um, that we uh, will be able to uh, receive a, an asset that is actually in good condition, that we don't have to be concerned about that it will fail with the first shower coming down. Um, but the same thing still occurs. Even if that, uh, that particular asset uh, was going to be damaged by HDC the, um, or NCC, the ratepayer still will be the one that actually be forking out. So once again, it's a different letterhead, but it's the same ratepayer, if that would be occurring. Thanks for the answer. Thank you. First. Well, that was the end of the... I've got, I've got an answer. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair. Right, you're forbearance. I'll just briefly make two points. Uh, firstly, is that um, uh, I think the fundamental of this is regionalism, all of those other things, but the fundamental of it is if we vote today to support this, and I will, and I do, then it puts the matter in the front of the ratepayers to make a decision about because we will be consulting with them. If we decide not to support this and turn it down, then the ratepayer will not be consulted and will not have their say. Now, I think that's the fundamental of this, that we should support this so that the people affected, the ratepayers, can make their decision about it. Not our decision, their decision. And I think if you support democratic processes, you will support this to go forward for ratepayers to, uh, to make their mind, mind up one way or the other. The second point in answer to uh, Councillor uh, uh, Foss's point, uh, it might be well to talk about HDC or NCC and the HBRC, but I think I just want to underscore the point of Councillor Van Bake is that it is the same ratepayer. So the ratepayer will be responsible for this at the, uh, no one else. It's not a different set of ratepayers, it's the same ratepayer. All that is going to be different is who is going to undertake the work and the consultation and levy the rate for the work. That's the only thing that's going to change here. So <clears throat> I think it's a great paper and I'm really pleased to support it. Councillor Bake, you want oh, to speak? Chair, can I, to, sorry, can I have a 10? Yep, I, didn't, I asked call for people who didn't speak, but... I know, but you, you experienced politicians, you're really good at swinging me one <laughs> way or the other. Um, look, I... I, I <laughs> <Is> a challenge. <laughs> yeah. um, the last few days, look, I've experienced regional council assets doing a damn good job of protecting people's property, by and large, and as I said earlier, um, not everyone. But, we, you know, we saw the towns of... especially the towns of Waipakaro and Waipawa um, even if the, the level of the water was, you know, only that, that far below the top of the stop banks, um, nonetheless they were protected. So, um, <clears throat> for that, you know, for that reason, I'm, I'm keen to see this process carry on, and, and you know, particularly to your points. But also, Councillor Curtin, I sympathise um, with what you raise, and you know that the, the people in the middle of Napier have a right also to have their houses protected, and, and so. Um, we, we need to address that um, as well. But um, for now, I'm, I'm happy to carry on and let's hear from the people in the consultation and, 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 and see what they have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Van Bake. Good. OK. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll just sum up. Um, climate change is here to stay, and I, and I don't have to spell out what that means for us. We as governors, um, we have agreed that we will, uh, wherever we can, um, to mitigate, uh, but where need be, we also uh, will, um, will adapt. And that will mean to adapt to protect um, our, our ratepayers uh, uh, from floods, inundation and erosion. Uh, and eight years ago when we started the, uh, the journey of, um, of the strategy, um, the Tongoa to Clifton um, Coastal Hazard Strategy, uh, it wasn't a blank paper. There are actually houses and, and farms and roads and infrastructure in that particular area all along the coast. So we actually have a duty of care to, to protect them. Okay? Um, once again, it will be the community that will give us direction of what they would like to see happen in this particular space. Um, and the strategy um, is not confirmed yet, it's still in draft, and uh, we hope that we will have um, the, the communication and consultation uh, processes that are set out, uh, not just only with, with those who live on the coast, but also those who have interest uh, in, in the culture aspect of it, which is Tanga de Finua. They are also going to have, uh, have their say in, in all of this. 
Uh, we're talking about, um, about uh, personal cost. If we would walk away uh, from the coast and start to look at other areas of protection, um, we would be looking at personal cost to people where insurances will be cancelled and uh, houses, will, houses will be dilapidated and will have infrastructure that will actually be damaged. Um, I believe um, there is actually a live example of this. In 2005, uh, Matata in the Bay of Plenty, I just spent a bit of time there holidaying, um, a, a major uh, a debris and mudslide destroyed uh, 27 homes and damaged uh, 87 properties, resulting in an estimated $20 million damage. That was in 2005. You can double that, you know. That's $40 million just there. The Bay of Plenty Regional Council, in partnership with government, decided uh, that they actually will um, go into uh, consultation uh, with the property owners and they did a managed uh, retreat and bought uh, virtually all of the properties out. I think there was one property that actually um, found it difficult to agree to the, the terms. So the adaptive pathway um, that is being developed um, uh, through public consultation and rigorous resource consenting application processes will determine whether we can uh, do hard engineering, soft engineering, or how we will go about um, taking this work on. As with flood protection on the Heritonga Plains, the cost of protection will be for public and private good and shared equitably. We as a council, uh, we spend, um, and I'll just take one, one example, uh, regional parks. I'll just take a, a, a specific one, which is the Ahuriri Regional Park. And I'm all, favor, all in favour of Ahuriri and any of the national parks. I really are regional parks, and I spend a lot of time in them. But there we are, general rate, um, providing um, protection for the environment, improving the environment for the benefit of people to enjoy, but majorly to make sure that we have a healthy rohi. Okay? Um, councils need to rate for many things that have a common good, um, and that includes regional parks. Uh, and I believe that um, the initial cost that we are going to look at spending, we haven't decided on spending, on coastal um, protection is minimal. And the reason why I say that is we need to keep things in, in perspective. If we're going to spend large amounts of ratepayers' fund on parks but not assist with a strategy for managing and mitigating coastal hazards and developing more resilient communities along the Hawke's Bay shoreline, then we are failing in our regional duty of care. We cannot afford to back off on this opportunity to show the rest of New Zealand that we care for our communities and they were able to collaborate as one to deal with a very complex problem, and I would even call it a, a wicked problem. And this is not just a four-year or, or five-year plan, this is a hundred-year plan. If you read the draft strategy, it's a hundred-year plan. And once again, I must uh, uh, really give credence to those who've worked very hard, uh, our staff and the community together, who've actually come to this draft strategy, and it's, and it's a really good strategy, but it belongs to the community, it doesn't belong to us. Thank you. Thank you. I put the question. All those in favour of the resolution, uh, th three, four, and five on the paper, please say aye. 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 Country, no. No. Carried. Right. Now we move on to uh, item, the next item, which is item 10, and that is the uh, computer's gone down, Pad, sorry. Uh, um, update HBRC appointment and remuneration of director's policy. Would somebody be like to move this? We Chair, just before you do, with your indulgence, um, uh, I had a meeting this morning with uh, um, Councillor Taylor, yep. and she wished for me to convey to the meeting uh, an issue uh, in relation to these recommendations. So um, am I OK to speak to that? Sure. Uh, so it relates to the uh, recommendation 10.5. Five, yeah. Uh, and that is in the event that council by resolution suspends the policy and wishes to appoint a councillor uh, to a subsidiary of HBRIC. Uh, it is her view that appointment should be undertaken by the full board of HBRIC, not just um, uh, the independent directors. Uh, 
So you'll see the reference to independent directors yes. in the middle of 10.5. In the policy document itself, that's paragraph 64, if council was of a mind to support uh, Councillor Taylor's preference, uh, simply the deletion of the word independent uh, in both the recommendations and in the policy would resolve that issue. Um, I'm just registering that on her behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Could I just say that the counter factual to that is that if the uh, uh, is that if the council itself uh, uh, approves such a resolution to nominate one of their own, and then two of that group who nominated that person to be able to be uh, on the selection, the two councils on there, or if it was two, would deem to, in my view, have had a conflict of interest because they had participated in the pre-selection process. They would not be seen as independent people in making the decision. That's the only point. Normally in those things, you'll be like, uh, uh, how would I say it, nominating someone for a position in, a, in an entity and then being on the selection panel itself. You, know, you have made predetermination would be the issue that I think would be, the, would be there. It's not about uh, uh, shoving uh, council, uh, council, council off, it's about uh, independence of view. That's the issue, predetermination. Okay, so someone would like to move the paper. Um, I'll move the paper. Have a seconder, Council Wormsby. Any questions? Councillor Williams? I'm wondering, um, Chair, whether we could move the recommendations uh, absent actually adopting the policy. Um, because the first time I've seen the detailed drafting was for this meeting, and I've got about 10 items of um, wording that I think warrant some attention, which I'd be happy to give a flavour of. But it would be rather a slow and tortuous process to go through all of that in a kind of committee stage. Um, and so the direction of travel was there. In fact, it's even more than that. Um, the principles that are applied to the setting of that policy would be then endorsed, and perhaps we could bring finalised wording back to a subsequent meeting to confirm. And I could take that discussion offline. As I say, I'm happy to give some, some flavour of the issues I've got with the wording now, but the, it's, a law, it's the lawyer in me. There's some stuff in there that doesn't quite work yet. Okay, so you were moving, you were suggesting that uh, that the uh, up the resolution uh, 10 be adopted in principle, subject to finalising the wording, underlying wording at a subsequent council meeting. Yes, that, and that's provided we are not time bound here that we have to do this by Tuesday or something like that. And I'm just saying the, the subsequent yeah. council meeting. Yeah. So, uh, in the next in, in the intervening month, we can go through the issues that you have raised, resolve them, and then come back yep. and finalise the fine work. Yep, I'm happy with that. I'm are you? happy with that. Okay, Chair, Chair sir, can you? I, I'm just with Blim and Stella. I'm on the policy itself. Which what does the recommendation say that you are talking about? Number ten. Number ten. What? Adopts and the appointment. Adopts, adopts the appointment. So what the, res the resolution is saying yeah. that we adopt ten item ten in principle, subject to the underlying uh, policy paper being finalised and brought back to the next council meeting. Because so council at, the at the moment it says uh, Councillor Foss adopts the policy as amended. In other words, precisely the wording that's there now. So as the chair has just suggested it's just adopting it. In other words, the principles are those following points. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wording still to be refined. Uh, can I comment? Yes, you'd probably say that. Uh, okay, that, that kind of points um, to some of the issues I, I have with this document. As I think our colleagues know, I've been particularly agitated by a lot of um, the gestation of this. And I think Councillor Williams has just touched on the resultant of a process which I don't think has been the normal uh, uh, unintended consequence of, of a process which is policy formation, because policy is, is crucial. It's, it's, it describes everything. It's a, it's a reference point, our benchmark. I, I have, from typos to probably contradictions in the policy and our attachments, um, which I, I was wanted to raise, um, and then the substantive issue itself, 
um, which I'll just touch on now and then get your direction on this ne next part. Um, but colleagues, my, my point here is a consistency of treatment. Um, so we have what we have with our various structures from the Regional Council, HBRIC, Port and some other organisations, and very importantly, ambitions to have many other organisations such as um, the limited partnerships that we have. What I'm seeking is consistency of approach, etc., on all of these. I do not see any different whatsoever in the way a councillor on the port manages their conflict of interest, their responsibilities as a public service, or sorry, perceived conflict of interest, and the commercial disciplines. Um, we've been well served, and those people have managed that very well. It, it can be tough, but they have. And I cannot see how that cannot also be the case and many other organisations that, in one way, shape or form, this organisation owns slash control. I'll just stop you there. Yeah, you, so you've, you've started to... Yeah, get, I know, so... You've, you've looking drifted, for your direction. You've drifted way off and headed into the substance of the discussion and wanting to debate... Question about this issue, Mr Chair. Yeah, no, you, you asked the question about what does this mean, yeah. and the point I'm making to you is that Councillor Williams is quite... Uh, I just want to observe that we have been through this a number of times. There's a document which has got lots of tracks changes in it, which says that we've been over it a few times. I'm happy to accept that on reflection, Councillor Williams has some other thoughts about it. I, I no problem about that. We're looking to get the best job we can do here. I'm not opposed to that, so I'm not rushing. So I'm perfectly happy to accept uh, his uh, suggested amendment that we adopt this in principle, subject to the underlying document being reviewed and uh, 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 reviewed and coming back in its latest edition to the next council meeting. So we de we'll have to go have an offline discussion about that again, go through it again, where all of the items that Council Williams raised will go through, and then it will come back to that for a substantive debate. That's close to where I was going to offer an amendment in that we deferred it for more work, mm. um, which is close to what? It's what, exactly what it is. So, well, it's not actually, because we're accepting it in, in principle, but we're going to change something else. So. Anyway, um, so, what do you want to do? So if I could be clear, Mr Chair, I'm very happy with 10.1 to 10.13. I think they're an excellent encapsulation of everything we've discussed. What I have seen for the first time is the actual wording that expresses those, That's and right. I'm not quite sure it's there. Okay, it's very good. Yeah, I, I just want to point out that we just be a bit patient around this, because it is the first time that we've been put in this situation to review this particular policy. Thank and you. we are doing our best through workshop Thank to you. get there. Um, but I do agree with the principles, and this is adopting what we went through in the committee meeting, um, and that I think we are heading in the right direction based on what we've all given in feedback in the past. We're trying to lift the standard of independence um, and trying to take good governance into better governance in terms of our role for, first and foremost as councillors. So I'm happy in principle with all these points, yet giving space to the particulars and the details that are worded that come back to the next council meeting. So as you've suggested, Chair, Thank you. That and we I, do that. And I think it would be helpful too, because I'd like to have a discussion with Councillor Taylor about her perspective on this, and so let's tease out the issues and see where the balance lies. Yeah, We can do that, it's no problem. All right, so it's almost... Would you like a, a discussion with Councillor Foss? Uh, well, yeah, we have, we have a kick. Of course I do it. Right. But the point <laughs> is that Councillor Taylor was not here today, put forward something, and I'd like to be able to respond to her directly. I can respond to you directly here, and have done, and we've had an exchange, so you're in a better position, she is, but I'd like to do that with her specifically because of the issue she raised. So it's almost a procedural motion. Do people want to debate it or treat it as a procedural motion and leave the substance to the intervening month and come back to it later? What's on the table again? Sorry. That we adopt in principle the recommendation here, subject to the underlying paper, uh, 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 the policy uh, go, being reviewed in the intervening month and to come back in this finalised form to the next council meeting. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Curtin. Mr. I'm worried Chair. when you raise points of order. <laughs> uh, just in terms of process, we have had a, uh, a this has been through a committee stage. Yes. 
uh, it had there have been opportunities to reflect on it. Yes. Um, I appreciate um, some desire to to resolve some. Um, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the the issues are, but there are. I agree, there's some sort of syntax and other issues need to resolved. Um, and also, it sounds like a very substantive issue to to be considered. Um, so, how is that done? Do we arrive back in a month in a month's time or the next council meeting? Uh, in the same position, but with um, iterations going on uh, independently, separately, and without um, a further uh, collective view of, of the position. Well, I mean, what does the final document look like? Uh, how I mentioned this is that we passed this resolution. In the intervening month, we would have a workshop where the uh, policy document would be put on the deck. I would invite uh, prior to that happening, Councillor William, to indicate what the issues he would have put them on the deck, we'd all discuss them, go through them, get a, get a sense of where it is. We can put into, the, into it the issues that Councillor Foss has raised, uh, Councillor Taylor, have a discussion and come back to as best we can an agreed paper to come directly to the next council meeting. So it would be a thoroughly worked, reworked paper. Why don't you just leave it on the table then and do that? Well, I've you moved just said to add to follow those recommendations, that's not what Councillor Williams said. He said in principle. I said in principle. Okay. I said with the motion is we adopt the thing in principle. Anyway, my suggestion as a humble councillor, why would you leave it on the table? You, you encapsulate it very well, and, and there is some information in there that hasn't been before any committee, so therefore um, potentially just do what you just said. It would be great. With respect, that's not quite correct. This top policy has been to a, 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 a planning meeting. We've gone through it. It has been to the uh, 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 corporate and strategic meeting, which has been through in the committee stage. It is now, in, in my view, in its fourth iteration. So we have been through this. But in the, in the point of view, of Councillor Williams has been through it again as thorough as he is. I respect that, and he wants it to be as best as it can, and I respect that too. Uh, and I've said to, I just think we should have a clear. Uh, uh, I've moved the resolution, which is we adopt this in principle, principle, subject to the underlying policy document uh, being reworked in the interim uh, to come back to the subsequent council meeting for adoption, which I think is a very fair. Statement of position. You okay with that, Councillor Williams? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I'll put the put the recommendation. All those in favour will say aye. All right. Aye. Contrary, no. Carry. Uh, sustain. Abstain. Councillor Foster's abstained. All right. Sorry. Afternoon tea. Yes. Are we ready for afternoon tea? I think we need a break. Sugar break. <laughs> 3.30, can we be here at 3.45? Yeah.
Seconded. All those in favour say aye. Country no carried. Aye. Summary report for the CT has a strategy and joint committee. Okay. So um, taken as read, but I just would like to point out that uh, we're actually going through a, a community and engagement uh, program at the moment, and we're actually sending out uh, surveys. Uh, they've been posted online, uh, local cafes and retail outlets. And so far, 78% of um, the returns are in favour of we as uh, Hawkesbury Regional Council taking over um, and <clears throat> managing it from the front. So um, that's really positive and that's good to hear. Any questions, if there are? Questions? Someone would like to move the report? I'll move. So I'll move to... I'd just like to speak. To <laughs> <laughs> oh, here goes another quarter of an hour. Can you please put the clock on, Mr. Chair? Because you failed to do that last time. I was generous. He took advantage of my good spirit. All right, I'll put the question. All those in favour of receiving the report, say so aye. 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 Garrett. Item 11, report from the EICC committee. Uh, Council, would you like to... Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillors. Um, not as intense as um, corporate and strategic, but we still had an informative um, update and reviews and research. So um, a big welcome to Pippa, who's joined the team as our um, Climate Action Ambassador. Um, and obviously we'll see um, the celebration of the end of report around our um, predator free. Um, and I think that's about it. Thanks, um, Chair. Thank you. An entirely organic report. It's lovely. Yep. Uh, uh, all right. Would you like to move your report? I will move it and, and to say that I'm looking forward to our future EICC meetings um, across the door here. Across the door here. Someone here, like here. to second it. I'll second yeah, it. I'll second it. Oh. Uh, Councillor Curtin. All right. Are there any questions? Uh, all right. <coughs> no questions. I'll... Anybody like to speak? Councillor Foley. Oh, just to um, let everyone know that I actually had a visit from Dr. Edgar Burns down to my farm. Well, it might have been the next week, but um, yeah, and just we sat around the coffee table for three hours, and I thought, man, if you know, had the ability to do that with um, um, any of the staff um, here, you just get to learn from each other um, a lot more about, about where each other's coming from. So really worthwhile um, session with Dr Edgar and certainly got a lot more respect for Tama's views and, and where he's coming from, so very worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? I've got a question. Uh, how come uh, Councillor Foley is the favoured child? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I want to know how much it cost us. He yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>, asked nicely. <laughs> All right, I'll put the question that the report be received. All those in favour will say aye. 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 Contrary, no. Carried. Report from the RTC. Yeah, Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, happy to take that essentially as read. There's only one item I wanted to speak to. I participated in this is the Public Transport Planning Review um, broader to the, the, the on-demand trial. I, I really enjoyed participating in a, in a workshop led by Emma Cagney, who's um, doing a network review, top to bottom and side to side, bottom to top, region wide, um, of opportunities and, and needs. And, and, and just the, the level of data that they are accumulating on where people live, their demographics, their deprivation index, where they're going, uh, when they're going there, um, is going to be such an enormously powerful tool uh, to think about what resources we put in place uh, for a future public transport network that isn't just confined to these guys, these big large diesel buses, principally servicing Hastings and Napier. <coughs> um, but I, I equally have to caution that uh, every single question comes down to resources. Uh, and every answer that would be optimal from a public transport perspective is likely to be the most expensive. Uh, and, and all roads lead to that roam of the word ratepayer. So um, we are going to need to ensure that the interventions are the best bang for the buck in terms of providing greater equity of access to those who currently don't have it. Uh, in Wairua, Central Hawke's Bay, uh, wherever it might be within Napier and Hastings, um, and, and in thinking about what format, shape and size 
buses, fleets, uh, areas of coverage are. Uh, for example, uh, the more extensive the coverage of the network, the more clunky the system is. The more places that bus tries to go to, the longer it takes for anyone getting on it to get where they want to go to. So you've got trade-offs, and it's just fascinating when you really sort of lift the hood on this as these people are doing. Uh, you know what you find out that you didn't know. So it's a great, um, it's a great project, and I'm looking forward to seeing it progress. That's what I really Thank want to you. Say. All right. Any questions? Councillor Curtin. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, um, Councillor Williams, I just wondered whether you can help. Um, uh, we've had the odd exchange on the 80k limit um, on, on the State Highway 5. Um, I still don't understand where Katahi is coming from, what their rationale is. Is this a trial? Is it going to come to an end? Are they doing any outcome measurements? Where does it all go? Um, have, have, uh, is that worthy of some sort of brief at some point? Uh, can you do it in two minutes or is it, is it a bigger picture than that? I'll give you a, a snapshot now. It's again from the Cape Ranger to the Bluff. Um, I think there's 350 kilometres of Hawke's Bay roads that are up for review uh, in the next two years, uh, putting the same metrics into the same computer model, spitting out very probably the same answer. It's all driven on consequences. You, the faster you go, the bigger the mess. It's as simple as that. And if you work from that proposition, uh, unless you are Transmission Gully, the Eastern Arterial, the Waikato Bypass, you are ADK. So look out, NZ, that's what's happening, uh, and either get used to it, or we need to challenge the system and, and look at the model. So that, that's, the, that's the snapshot there. Um, there's a lot of people who don't quite get where they're coming from, uh, and we are really, I guess, leaning on them to ask that question uh, to, to do a more systematic uh, approach to, to road safety than just speed. I'm not sure if that's answered. No, that, 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 that's fine. Uh, if I could just follow with a small supplementary. Small? It's very small, very small. Um, just in terms of the Transport Committee's position and road safe's position, um, is, is there uh, support or lack of support? You know, what, what is their position on this, given their, their sort of counter role, if you like? Um, well, as you know, road safety has been going through a review and will now be uh, uh, progressed through a subcommittee of the technical advisory groups of each of the local authorities rather than with a, a sole uh, resource within this organisation. There hasn't been a formal um, uh, advisory stream from road safe as it has been into this conversation, but my understanding is that... Uh, if one were to ask for that, it would be consistent with the Transport Committee's position that uh, we, we're challenging the decision made. That Road Safe has exemplified for years a more holistic approach. Driver education, enforcement, fatigue management, um, you know, the, the, the expos, uh, really sort of bringing the, the, to life the children, uh, when I say children, teenagers, um, what they're dealing with when they get behind the wheel. Um, you know, car safety, road safety, driver safety, all of it. Uh, so to just intervene in one part of the system is like uh, flying a plane on the oil gauge. Councillor Van Bake. Yeah, um, there's a report eight by the uh, Regional Relationships Director from Kotahi, and I'm, it must be a slip of the uh, of the pen. Uh, vehicle safety ratings will now be cons now considered the impact not just on vehicle passengers, but also on pedestrians in the environment. I talked to a, um, an ED nurse, and um, m most of the broken bones that actually come from uh, traffic accidents are from cyclists. Why are cyclists not mentioned in that? Not mentioned in the... V if you 8.2, vehicle safety ratings will now consider the impact that vehicles have on pedestrians and environment, not just vehicle passengers. So are you reading from 8.2 of what, sorry, there? Are you saying there should be re pedestrians and cyclists? Yeah, so okay. cyclists are the key ones that actually end up with broken bones. I, through, I you you you, through you, Chair, I think it's intended. Uh, it's just not written. Everything we've had from uh, Waka Katahi about that has been about uh, non 
motorised, so everything other than impact on cars, so okay. people, slip, either on bikes or walking. Slip of the pen. Thank you. Thank you. That's a contraction. All right. Now, Councillor Williams, you moved this. Who seconded it? Councillor Van Bake. Uh, I think we've had enough on this, haven't we? All right, I'll put the question. All those in favour will say aye. 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 Contrary, no. Carried. Uh, I'm conscious we've got two items uh, to come down the line. Council reporters on meetings outside bodies. Councillor Van Bake. I'll make it really quick. Um, just to uh, report, um, while, while um, the uh, trans Regional Transport Committee is in the limelight and is now to be the committee to be on, it sounds, uh, it seems, um, we're actually going through a restructure or at least a look at um, the uh, Hawke's Bay Cycle Governance Group on the 11th, I think it is, we are having a workshop on this. Martin Williams is going to be part of that. So there are some major changes going to be happen in this particular space. This particular group may disband it, uh, or it may actually expand as a region of, of influence. I just thought I'd let you know uh, that uh, definitely Martin is really pushing this, and I'm, I'm really pleased about that, because it definitely needed to happen. Thank you. Good to hear. Good to hear. I fully support that. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, minor items not on the agenda. There were none. So would someone like to move that we go into public excluded? Uh, Councillor Van Bake, Councillor uh, Foss, all those in favour will say aye. 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 Contrary, no carried. Right, can we shut the. Are we public off, but we need to leave James on. Yeah. 